Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oates. Welcome to Everything Co-op. My guest this morning is Esteban Kelly. Good morning, Esteban. Good morning, Vernon. Good to be back. How are you this morning? Good. I'm glad to have you back. Yes, really <laughs> glad to have you back. And you are the executive director of the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops. What is the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops? Yeah, for those who don't know, the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops were the only national grassroots membership-based organization for workaround cooperative businesses in the U.S. So we have members all around the country. We also represent worker co-ops in the international space with our peers in, in other countries. And then we have several dozen local co-op networks that are in our membership as well that often offer services and training or uh, business services or just support and leadership development opportunities for worker owners in all different parts of the country where there's maybe more concentrations of worker co-ops. So we do advocacy, we do uh, technical assistance. We're basically a trade association for worker-owned businesses in all different sectors across the economy. I'm sure we'll talk about that later. And our members actually elect our board. We have elections every year and um, 100% of our board members are from the members themselves. Most of them are worker owners. A lot of them are people of color or immigrants or founders of cooperatives. Um, some of them do technical assistance themselves as developers. Um, and then we have a pretty powerful staff of about 15 people organizing all these programs and, and services. You have to 15 people. Wow. All right. You've been gro- you all have been growing. I know. I haven't been on the show in a couple of years, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, most people that have listened to this show, because we've been on air now almost nine years. October will be nine years, Esteban, and I, I, wow. it's beyond my wildest dreams. We were only going to do it for one month, the month of October, which is co-op month, <laughs> uh, nine years ago. Uh, I like it, and people like you seem to like coming on, and we really appreciate talking about co-op. So what is a worker co-op? What is your definition of a worker co-op? Um, I think stripped down, it's pretty simple. I mean, they're, they're businesses that are owned and operated by the people who work there. Um, it doesn't always mean that 100% of the workers are the owners, but it does mean 100% of the owners are the workers, right? So sometimes um, some of our, our members will have uh, employees that aren't on ownership track. You know, it might be a design firm that also has a janitorial staff. And some of them might decide that um, that staff are eligible to be part of the team um, and to be owners. Or some of them might just say, oh, we just contract to another company or we hire individuals. Um, they might even employ them. Um, but that, that would be separate from, from being on the ownership track. Um, but I think it's different than a lot of traditional or investor owned um, businesses where there could be people who don't work there and they're, they may be put up some capital to get the business started or to help expand the business. They might be investing in that sense. Um, but, but if they're not owners of the, if they're not working at the business actively, um, then that would be the departure from, from worker co-ops. I think it's also different from consumer co-ops, whether that's housing or utilities or uh, retail consumer co-ops, um, where I think a lot of your listeners are familiar with that model because that's the largest um, part of the co-op sector in the U.S. other than maybe agriculture. Um, and and I'm a member of many consumer co-ops, and, and um, it, it is different because it's not the place that I think about every day. Uh, it's not the, which is to say, you know, as a worker owner in my own co-op, um, I was on the show a few years ago talking about my co-op, Aorta. I think about my business 
Monday through Friday because I work there. But I also think about it on the weekends because I'm a business owner. <laughs> yeah. uh, even if I'm not working, I it is it is there. It's in the background. Um, and that's that's part of what it means to be a worker owner. It's, it is a little different than being a member owner of a consumer co-op where you, you might think about it when you're planning out your errands to go shopping or when you're paying your electricity bill or something um, or where you're telling your neighbors at a potluck why they maybe should uh, join or participate in a consumer co-op. But nothing else about the structure of their lives change. It's really about consumption um, and maybe building in, layering in a bit of more community. Um, and social connection. Whereas when you're a when you're a worker owner, it's your it's your full time and you know it's it's your work life. <laughs> um, and so the meaning uh, of inviting in the cooperative principles and practicing them um, every day and um, deliberating democratically with your co owners, um, I think is really powerful. It means we have uh, a lot of. Uh, experience in stewarding those principles and values um, and it it means that we also learn a lot with some of the struggles of that um, and it's uh, one of the things that we try to offer to our friends in the other sectors so I, I you made a lot of great points here the consumer co-op is what most Americans belong I think the estimate is about 1.4 million 140 million Americans belong to co-ops. Most of those are credit unions, rural electric, housing co-ops. The consumers own and control the business. Too often they don't know that. That's the problem. Too often they don't know that they're a co-op. And that's what the similarity between a worker and a consumer is, that the members own and control the business. Or they have a right or ability to own and control it if they know it. Some rural electric co-op, particularly in the South, it may be a, a, a community of 50% African American, but they don't know that they can vote for the board or run for the board and control the business. And so too often in that situ- circumstance, they own it, but they definitely don't control it because they don't even know. In a worker co-op, workers know. <laughs> they know. Yes, they do. They, yes, they do. <laughs> they own it. They control it. They can run for the board. They uh, vote for on the board members. They have a say in the decision of of the business, including if it's profit, where does the profit go? And and that's why I like co-ops. That's that's why I love co-ops. How long have you been in this business? Well, I've been involved in co-ops since the late 90s, so maybe like a little over 20 years, coming up on not quite 25 years yet. (laughs) Not yet. Yeah, but over 20 years, and I've been... Uh, a worker owner in some form for a lot of that time because I actually got involved as a student in a student run cooperative that did uh, we did room and board we ran a whole industrial kitchen <laughs> and uh, for all the residents uh, so it was a housing co-op but it also we had our own factory we uh, or our, our own warehouse so we did group purchasing and we we were feeding close to 1500 people a day anywhere from one to three meals a day distributed across 23 different properties. Um, so it was the largest student co-op in the U S and where is that? Where's that co-op? This is in Berkeley, California. It's autonomous from the university of California, but, um, right, right, right adjacent to campus. And in fact, some of their properties are leased from the university. Um, just a couple of them. Most of them, they're owned, um, and they've been around since the 1930s. They, they did a, a lot of expansion, actually, when some of the fraternities and and re- even like rooming and boarding houses went went belly up after World War II uh, and in the 60s, and they were able to to acquire some of those properties that were kind of an ideal footprint for them. But I, I do think about it less as a purely a housing co-op and more as a uh, some blend of a worker co-op because I had to do at least five hours of labor every week, um, formal, like I filled out a timesheet for it. And that work wasn't just, pay, I don't know, what do you do in a housing co-op? Paying bills or serving on the board, but actually cooking meals. I was a prep cook. Uh, I drove a truck around or I was I was one of the delivery drivers. My friend Charlie drove the truck <laughs> uh, and I sat shotgun and we would drive around all the properties and give them their crates of whatever um, their kitchen manager had, had ordered. So we would load up the, at the warehouse um, 
and, you know, pushing around all the hand trucks and, and having worked in grocery stores uh, in the past, it was very clear to me like, oh, no, this isn't just a housing co-op. This is very similar to what it looked like working uh, at Trader Joe's as a teenager and stocking the fridges and wheeling the crates around. Um, I also had the privilege uh, by time I was later later on in, in my years at the university of, of getting one of the cushier jobs, just cleaning the hot tub, <laughs> which was nice. Uh, so, yeah, that's um, <clears throat> my time goes back to that. And afterwards, I, uh, I was the director of education and training for NASCO, which represents almost all of the, the student co-ops in the U.S. as well as Canada, primarily as housing co-ops. Most of them weren't as sophisticated in their operations to have things like uh, a shared warehouse and a fleet of trucks and all, all the other bells and whistles. But in that role, I had... And I just wanted to go back to what did you learn at Berkeley in the co-op? I know you're taking all these classes and you're getting the theory and all of that, but what did you learn that particularly could help you in the last 25 years? What kinds of things did you learn in that co-op as a student? In the co-op as a student, not as a student on campus that informed my co-op work. (laughs) I think a lot of it is governance. You know, it's, it is funny. Yeah. A lot of it is governance. Now, you know, I'm, I've been the executive director for the worker co-op federation for seven years. Um, and I'm the vice chair of the board for, uh, national cooperative business association. And I've been involved in a lot of cooperative governance and, it's a, it's a little easier to say this now with perspective that I think that students involved in cooperative governance are some of the best experts we have. They really are. That's where I learned everything about uh, order, rules of order and process, proposing and amending items, dividing the questions, um, weighing and considering different uh, perspectives and opinions, making sure different voices mattered. We use different decision-making processes depending on, I lived in three different houses. One of them was actually an apartment complex that had hundreds of people living there. Um, and so some used consensus, some just used a straight um, simple majority vote, um, different thresholds depending on what it is that you're amending uh, with bylaws and things like that. All of that, you know, conflict resolution, facilitation, how to make sure that everyone's voices matter, how to weight minority opinion especially in consensus process. That's all stuff I learned as a, as a young cooperator. And, and I, I still, I draw on that experience, um, even just serving as a board member in other places. So learning how to work with people, learning how to make decisions, learning how to communicate in actual, like live real time, not, not theory. This is what consensus management is. This is what democracy is in the theory and the textbook, but you're, you're doing it. You're doing it. Yeah, I would say both. I mean, I really was talking about things that were very formal, like the policies, the house rules, the bylaws, which is complex. I mean, they're running a multi-million dollar operation out there. And there was also the informal stuff about communication and, and really living in a diverse community. I mean, I didn't vote on who lived in my house. So I, I was living with like, yeah, very all walks of life. There was a Navy SEAL in my first co-op. About, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> we got to take our first break and we'll come back and we'll talk more about what you use, how you use that knowledge. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. My guest today is Esteban Kelly. Esteban Kelly is the executive director of the Federation of Worker Co-ops. And in the first segment, we just talked about him learning so much uh, as a, in a housing co-op in Berkeley, California. In that housing co-op, they also provided food, and it was more like a worker co-op. Vernon, I was going to maybe pick up our, our conversation about what, what it is that I was learning as a student cooperator. And connecting that to the importance of cooperative education, I uh, really became aware of the broader ecosystem. A lot of the the guests you've had on your show by going to my first co-op conference, which was the Cooperative Education and Training Institute that NASCO has been putting on for 40 years now, 50 years now, since 1970 one or something like that. And uh, it's an organization that was 
started in um, 1968. And I think cooperative education and those kind of conferences are important for uh, both of the reasons we were just talking about. The formal education and training that happens, including, you know, getting inspired by the, the keynotes and the bigger flashier sessions, um, but also the social relationships that you build in those spaces. And I'm thinking about that today because I know one of the things we were going to talk about is the upcoming worker co-op conference. We're hosting that here in Philadelphia. That's where I'm based. Um, and we haven't had a national worker call conference in Philadelphia before. We usually rotate um, through different regions of the country for that flagship event, and we only have, hold it every two years. So, of course, two years ago in 2020, it was virtual. So it wasn't hosted in any particular place. It was online, but it was popular. We had people from all over the world. Um, two, oh, close to 2,000 people were registered for that. And the last time we were in person was in California, in L.A., in 2018. So this is going to be our first time coming together for a national in-person worker co-op conference um, in Philadelphia in September 9th and 10th. And uh, very, very much looking forward to it. So September 9th and 10th. And where is it going to be again? It's going to be in Philadelphia. We're hosting part of it, including our annual meeting um, at a Quaker center, because we're, we're holding a lot of things outdoors. There's going to be a festival, a rally for worker ownership, where we're inviting elected officials to come and speak to uh, their support for worker co-ops and why they support workplace democracy, um, as well as other friends, you know, people who lead unions and uh, leaders from within our sector. Uh, and then we're having our, our annual meeting inside of a Quaker meeting house, uh, which is the only time we're actually going to have a larger group assembled together. Uh, we'll be masked and indoors for that. And then the second day is at Temple University um, in their center city campus across from um, the beautiful city hall building in the center of Philadelphia, literally overlooking that plaza and, and that building. And we're setting it up instead of having a lot of different workshops where people are mixing, we're setting it up in tracks where people just sort of go deep with their, their pod, who they're learning with, who they're having deep uh, strategy and discussion uh, and doing the, the kinds of um, conversations that are hard to do on Zoom, where you can really connect together in person and have that matter and go deep with, with that particular pod. And then we're closing out with a, uh, a worker cop award ceremony. And we always have um, live music or DJs and dancing and, and that kind of thing. So that's, it's just a Friday, Saturday, we're, we're slimming down the whole event um, to give people more spaciousness with COVID and childcare and travel and also time to just connect, you know, to have an unstructured day uh, on Sunday. You can either get home easily or you can make plans to connect with some of the people who are also going to be in Philadelphia for that event. So I am right now, I am in San Diego, but I would love to be there in September. I don't think I'm going to be back. I think I'm going to still be out on the West Coast. Uh, but that sounds like fun, particularly I like the training and the learning. And when you talked about Federation of Worker Co-ops, you said advocacy and technical support. I also wrote down training because I know a lot of it. I, I, went, I went to your conference when you had it in Baltimore and just got a lot of knowledge and a lot of people in that event. So I, I'm, I would love to be there in September. I'm also very much still concerned about COVID. So I like that you're having things outside and you're making mm -hmm. folks have to be up. Are you making it so that people have to be um, show their vaccine, show that, or do temperature checks? Are you still going to do anything like that? Yeah, I'm actually really proud of our team and how we've designed this to be safe, um, not only for this one-off event, but I think it is going to be a model. I mean, we're always going to iterate and learn from it. A model for how to do in-person events while protecting and looking out for our community. Obviously, people who have like very extreme concerns should, should just stay home. It's why we do so much virtual programming. You know, most of what we've done for the last two and a half years has been, on, or all of it has been online <laughs> exclusively. Um, but we also know how important it is for people to connect in person. So we're requiring um, N95 or KN95 masks. Um, at all times indoors. We're requiring everyone to be vaccinated uh, with three shots. So a booster is part of that. And uh, yeah, we're going to do testing. We were able to get the city's Department of Public Health to donate like a thousand <laughs> rapid tests for us. Um, and at least for our staff members, we're, uh, we're, we're going to be doing PCR tests in advance as well. Well, that's wonderful. With all of that, if I was on the West Coast, I, on the East Coast, I would be there. 
because I'm 75 years old and have previous dispositions. I'm one of those black folks that diabetes and hypertension that runs in my family. Right. And so immune system, and you can't check the immune system. There's no way to go in and say, oh, you're a, your immune right. system out of, out of 10 is an 8 or a 5 or a 3. Right. <laughs> you don't know what's going to happen. Then I had a fight with prostate cancer. So I think my immune system is probably high, but I don't know. So I just don't want to take chances because I'm doing what I love. Right. Talk to you about co-op. So I want to be around and play with my great-grandchildren. Speaking of future... How do you see the future of our economy? How do, how do you break down looking at the future of our economy and particularly the role that worker co-op could play in it? Yeah. Um, I know one of the reasons why the show is interested in having me back on is because of the cover story that I co-authored for the summer issue of Nonprofit Quarterly um, this year, where we dug into exactly that. My piece was called Visions Toward Democratizing Our Economy, and I co-authored it with Melissa Hoover, who's the executive director for the Democracy at Work Institute. And they're um, a loosely affiliated sister organization to the Worker Co-op Federation. They're a C3 nonprofit and we're a, a C6 uh, trade association. So I think the editors were interested in seeing what it would look like for us to put our brains together and share a vision for what's possible and where this can go. So we, we did that. We sort of took a speculative look. It's fun. It reads like speculative fiction a little bit. And uh, and actually, there's gorgeous illustrations for those who uh, get a chance to get either the digital or the paper version of Nonprofit Quarterly. They worked with Afrofuturist artists and just like vivid colors and gorgeous imagery. And all the other pieces are incredible. Honestly, if you only get one issue, get this issue, not just because of what I wrote, but every piece in there is extraordinary. And it's all of the people you've had on this show, like Camille Kerr, like Adria Powell from Cooperative Home Care Associates. They're, um, so they're, they all talk about um, different aspects of, uh, of uh, the solidarity economy and economic democracy. Um, I know we're coming up on a break, but one piece I'll say is that we uh, we looked at a 15-year horizon, Melissa and I, um, and sort of looked at, like, what are some of the things that would get in the way of expanding economic democracy? And we, we looked at that more broadly than just co-ops and more broadly than just worker co-ops. We really looked at, um, uh, con- considered this from uh, a perspective of health equity, housing, land, agriculture, public banking, community health, you know, all the different ways that um, that workplace to, or that, economic democracy can touch our lives. And then we did focus on, when we were thinking about the specific barriers, we did focus on the things we experienced around capital, around policy and legislative barriers, things with the administration or small business administration from the federal government, and even the state jurisdictions and what's possible for things to really pop off and grow in certain regions of the country. So those are some of the things that maybe we can talk about after the break. There's a lot that we could talk about after this this next break. We'll be right back and talk about the future with uh, Esteban Kelly. Please don't touch that down. The program is being brought to you by the National Cooperative Bank. National Cooperative Bank has been our partner for the nine years. They've been a great partner. They became in existence in the 80s to provide financial services for the cooperative community and their members, particularly in low-income communities. That's where a lot of black and brown people live, indigenous people live in low-income communities, and NCB has been there and a great partner for this show. Esteban, before we took the break, you start talking about vision for democratizing economy, which is an article in the, the nonprofit quarterly review. What is democratizing economy? What is that? That's a great question. <laughs> and I apologize for zipping right into like, wh- how do we do it? When do we do it? <laughs> how does it get us toward, uh, you know, closing the racial wealth gap and all these other pieces? 
so yeah, I I thank you for slowing me down a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, economic democracy. If you think about political democracy, it's so limited. You know, how much of your life is actively shaped by participation in the political process? It's very little. Economic democracy posits that if you go beyond, you know, voting for PTA or your uh, school board or uh, in the primaries or proposing ballot initiatives and even, you know, the general elections, if you go beyond all of that, there's all these other aspects of our lives. And if we value democracy, if we're if we purport to be a, a democratic society, then that should touch all these other aspects. A huge piece of it is cooperatives. Right. Because we're saying that everything from your utilities to your housing to uh, your food system, not just the, where you're getting your groceries, um, but all, all along the chain, you know, things like farmers markets and supporting agriculture, that all of that should be owned and controlled by the, pe- the stakeholders um, involved in those businesses. Right. So that that would be one huge aspect of a democratic e- economy. But it also in- invites tools um, like what the Brazilians figured out with participatory budgeting. This is stuff that they started doing down there just like 20 years ago. Uh, and then it was popularized through the World Social Forum. And a lot of cities, uh, especially if you talk to urban planners, are really excited about what this model can do for engaging communities and for building neighborhoods to meet needs uh, of people. So it's not saying, hey, everyone, uh, we're abdicating our role as city council members or whatever um, and and turning it over. And it's in the hands of uh, a citizens assembly, although that that would be cool, too. Um, But actually just saying, listen, we have a budgetary problem. We only have X amount of money. You know, here's two million dollars and you can vote on if that's going toward a community pool or fixing up the existing playground or creating uh, more drought resistant community gardens or a combination of the things. But here's the constraints. We only have two million dollars. So you all are going to come together and vote. You all are going to come together and even say, what are the things you would like to see? You know, what are the options there? And then you're going to come together and vote. And that that is that's what we're going to move forward with. So bringing that technology of democracy, I often describe democracy as a technology, right, a social technology for how we govern our lives and our society and applying that to more aspects of our lives. And of course, the expertise that, that I'm bringing um, as a leader in worker cooperatives is around workplace democracy in particular. But I think even into building more democratic economic institutions like public banking, where we can be deposit holders, where pension funds can be deposited, where cities can be investing not in the extraction of our lives by sticking their money at all the, uh, the, the bad banks, <laughs> but, and I know this program is supported by uh, a great example, like something, a CDFI like National Co-op Bank, we want to see more things like that, that that's where the public uh, investments should be, uh, should be channeled. And then we can leverage that. Then we have the money to uh, build out public transit infrastructure, to finance our schools, to support small businesses, to even uh, dream about projects like converting a nonprofit hospital into a multi-stakeholder healthcare facility that's uh, cooperative for the patients and for the workers there, right? Yeah. Your excitement, is, it, it blows me away. I love your enthusiasm. I to slow you down a little bit and take you all the way back like, what is the <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So let's see if we can we can break it down because you said something I'm curious about. You said putting like pension fund money. Let, let's take a federal uh, um, uh, a state government and then yeah. all of their teachers pension fund. Where do they invest that money? And you talked about bad bank versus good bank. What what's the difference between a bad bank and a good bank? And you're here when you define that. When you say that. Well, we all got a very, very public, high profile lesson of that in between 2006 and 2008 and that financial crisis. That's an example of bad banks. They're not accountable to even our laws and like good behavior, uh, let alone to the deposit holders and the people, right? So they're running all kinds of shenanigans to extract. Uh, well, that's what they're set up to do. They're not pretending to do anything other than that. They're there to maximize profit and wealth and to do that off of the deposits that you put in, that they want to turn your your $1 into $5. That's the whole model. They keep the $4. If they turn the $1 into $5, then they keep yeah. the 4 and you yeah. get you get a dollar and one cent. You get about one percent or less than one percent return today on that deposit. Yeah, 
Okay. Right. Right. And it's not as a one-time transaction, which was the, which would be a basic principle of transaction. But with capitalism, it means that you need to do that uh, in, over and over every year. So you not only need to make that profit of, let's say, $4 off of the one, but then the next year you need to make a profit above that. Now you need to make $5. And then the next year you need to make 6 And so that's why capitalism is constantly in crisis, that it is not only rent seeking um, and and profit seeking and trying to maximize that, but it needs to maximize that year after year after year, which is why we have these cycles of crashes. All to say that when Lehman Brothers or Goldman Sachs, uh, when a lot of those banks made bad investments and were messing around with, with money, we're the ones who suffered. Our economy suffered. People's retirement was wiped out. And if we were able to instead have things like, let's say, a pension fund invested in something like a, a, a public bank, then they're mission driven. So any of the investments that they're doing are actually to serve the public. Um, but also they're much more accountable to uh, to regulators. There's an example of this actually in North Carolina. It's the only current you know, op- currently operating state-owned public bank, and they've been doing this for, for many, many decades now in North, uh, sorry, did I say North Carolina, North Dakota? <laughs> North Dakota is the only one. Um, but there's a huge momentum right now in all of this uh, around the public banking movement. The city of Philadelphia just passed a resolution. Uh, Los Angeles just did, San Francisco. It's all, all over the country. People are taking this stuff seriously um, and moving forward. There's more information if, if your listeners are interested uh, with an organization called the Public Banking Institute. Uh, I'm in a fellowship program right now with their executive director. Um, so where we've been learning about actually this question of economic democracy, uh, we're, we're fellows with the Institute for the Future, um, the Futures for Good fellows. And we're looking at equitable enterprises and, and other aspects of what does it look like to lay the foundation now for the democratic economy that we need. Um, well, we need it now also, but certainly we're going to need it even more in the future with the different crises that are coming and, and disproportionately impacting communities of color uh, and working people. So in, in this article that you wrote, you had four scenarios. And the first one, I guess, is nothing changed. Then the second one, the limited progress. Explain those to me. What, what, what do you mean is what we know if there's obstruction, if, if it keeps going the way it is? Yeah, some of the audio cut out a little bit, but I think maybe I can repeat parts of the the question. It was sort of looking at um, the piece that I co-authored with Melissa was looking at Melissa Hoover was looking at different scenarios of what's possible in the next 15 years. And the first two scenarios were, were just thinking about basically some version of the world we know. And of those two, the first one was looking at If everything about how politics operates, about how development is progressing, if all that stuff mostly continues, but we face a couple, we continue to face barriers and obstruction, what's possible there? And so we looked at, um, for example, if the Small Business Administration, which currently has a regulation that uh, prohibits worker and consumer owned co-ops from from accessing 7A loans, which most small businesses have full access to. And meanwhile, the government knows how important and beneficial cooperatives are for communities all over the country, including rural communities. So they know co-ops are good, but then another aspect, another department of the government says under this regulation, uh, we have a whole program and we're not really supporting them um, in any way. Uh, So we looked at what happens if there are politicians or regulations or financial regulations that get in the way from actually scaling and resourcing cooperatives and other uh, aspects of the, the democratic economy. Okay. So what did you come up with any conclusions on what happens if things just stay the way they are? We, we saw there still being some growth. I think that's, that's sort of the, the, the direction that things are going is that things would, there would still be some progress that we would still have to, I think rather than getting at scalar solutions, there would still need to be a lot of experimentation. There would probably be a lot of messaging bills that weren't super substantive because we know that there are more and more, I'll just call them allies, <laughs> even just thinking federally in the federal government, in Congress and in the Senate who support cooperatives. And so we would probably see more of these these legislative uh, moves that don't have appropriation, that don't have financing behind them. So, for example, uh, the last time we had something 
until last week, which we'll talk about, um, federally passed that supported worker cooperatives was in 2018. It actually was the first time that there was any federal legislation, to our knowledge, that explicitly named worker cooperatives. Uh, And we got that passed. It was introduced by Senator Gillibrand from New York in the Senate and uh, by by Representative Nidia Velasquez in the House, who chairs the Small Business Committee. And it really directed the small business development centers through the SBA, Small Business Administration, to offer the the information and technical assistance that they already provide to the public and to small businesses um, to offer them information about cooperatives, about the possibilities of converting their businesses to being worker owned, especially for people who are retiring and for being capable of providing some technical assistance. That was more than just a messaging bill. I mean, it actually passed and was enacted into law, but it didn't have any financing behind it. You know, how are we training people to do this? Are we paying for that training to happen? There are thousands of small business development centers uh, scattered around the country. And is there financing to print new brochures and materials? You know, so is there financing for us to, to work with those SPDCs to provide? So that's kind of what we saw as the obstruction version of what's possible is more moves forward. But they were sort of like baby steps rather than the big strides that we know are possible and that we know we need. OK, so we're going to get ready for another break. So maybe if you could take a talk about if there's just a limited amount of progress, what could you see changing and happening? Well, we'll take that after we get off the break. Our guest today, we talking about the future. Okay, so Esteban, um, I just finished uh, reading a book called Donut Economics, and a lot of what you were saying in the article uh, mirrored what she was saying, or she was mirroring what you were saying, uh, you and Melissa. And what, what I liked about, I didn't like economics when I took it in school. But what I liked about what she was saying was changing the whole economic system, changing it all, and having worker co-ops, and the co-op was a big piece of it, having these these banks that you were talking about was a big piece of it. So let's talk about your second strategy was if there's just a limited progress, what would happen? Yeah, we were thinking about what would be the best case scenario if the world that we know kind of persists as it is. And a lot of what we were seeing is there being more clustering in the changes that happen. So basically places that already had a strong ecosystem of uh, cooperatives or of economic democracy, the solidarity economy, that, that we would see most of the growth happen concentrated in those places. So for example, uh, in Western North Carolina, where there's a lot of activity, um, smart development, the work that the industrial commons is doing, led by a lot of the folks at Opportunity Threads, really to think regionally, geographically, to continue to attract investment and philanthropic dollars, even without the support of the federal government directly or even the state government, right? We also saw more clustering within industries. So there are certain industries that where we've seen a lot of growth and development in the last decade, 15 years, 10, 15 years or so around domestic work, childcare, healthcare, social services, we probably would continue to see a lot of worker co-op development in immigrant communities um, and a lot of feminized labor, like pink collar jobs is sometimes what they're called, but also just some of the other places that we current, currently see it, you know, in transportation, there's innovations around taxi cooperatives. There's the new ride hailing app in New York City called the Drivers Co-op, which even since publishing this article, I've learned of their plans to go into different cities um, and to try to expand to new markets. So we, we, we speculated that we would see more um, of those kinds of programs and that they would be bankrolled by the establishment of public banks because we were sort of tracking the trending momentum of some of these different moves uh, and institutions and that there would probably continue to be more young 
politicians, not just federally, but on city councils, in state houses, legislatures, um, state senates, continuing to espouse the virtues of um, social housing, cooperative housing. And again, these are all things that we're picking up on. It's not wild speculation. It was really based on um, evidence and current signals of what we're seeing and drawing those trends out into the future. Also, since this was published, there was a victory here in Pennsylvania where State Senator Nikhil Saval um, got his legislation passed around some social housing, including some provisions around establishing worker cooperatives who could do retrofitting to make houses more energy efficient. So those are the kinds of things that we were drawing out and speculating, like, where would that happen? Probably not places that were repressing democracy, but you would see things like that pop off in Massachusetts or Vermont or California. So Madison, Wisconsin, Washington, D.C., New York, Mm -hmm. Crenshaw, South Central. Crenshaw is grassroots, bottom up. Brothers and sisters, they're doing it out there. Geographically and in certain industries. Okay, so if you get more change, what what do you see happening? Well, change could go in a lot of different directions. So the one thing I would say about the that that limited progress scenario, the second one, is that we kind of lift it up just to illustrate what happens from an ecosystem approach if multiple of these things are happening in one place. And so we projected that Colorado would overtake New York, California, Massachusetts, and Wisconsin uh, as being the state with more worker co-ops than anywhere else, and that that would be due to a confluence of leaders, institutions, and infrastructure. Um, Their governor supports worker co-ops, their their senators do. There are a bunch of uh, workforce development organizations there, groups working with uh, immigrants and refugees, and also a lot of innovation happening with legal forms in the state of Colorado and partnerships with with ESOPs, um, employee-owned companies as well. And so that sort of combination of people with a willingness and motivation to think differently and put these pieces together, uh, we thought illustrated like what we saw as possible there. I think if there was a lot of change and it went badly, (laughs) which is is, uh, not so hard to imagine, we would see, so for, for example, I think that would look like more surveillance and authoritarianism, climate, uh, climate chaos, the impact of things like wildfires and storms and droughts and disruptions to our food system, displacement for people affected by weather events, issues with debt, et cetera, et cetera. Th- th- those kinds of things. <laughs> we were like, okay, what happens if all of those things are sort of going on? And they're not, again, they're not wild speculation. They're reasonable things to consider is that co-ops would be seized upon from the grassroots as a solution to endure. And so we were thinking about the ways that cooperatives were really useful in the aftermath of Superstorm Sandy, of the 2008 financial crisis, and even in 2020, especially in spring of 2020, when people didn't know if it was safe to to drive across um, their county to get to their preferred food, uh, food hub or grocery store, that a lot of businesses became centers and sites of mutual aid, um, that they became food distribution centers, that there were different kinds of networks of care, uh, uh, including for, for things like healthcare, people checking on their neighbors. So we imagine like, oh yeah, there is that whole other wor- way that things could go where if the institutions themselves are corrupted or erode, there would be more of a grassroots um, communitarian move uh, from nonprofits to develop things like land trusts, to advance practices like participatory budgeting, you know, if, if things like state banks don't advance at that large institution level, like what are all the ways that people would would uh, advance democracy through mutualism and economic activity in their day to day lives? OK, now what happens if we get major change? <laughs> yeah, this is the world I want to live in, right, where, where we're actually able to put all those pieces together. We were thinking that the institutions of government and the economy would finally sort of get the message that we would have breakthroughs, we would have traction, and that unlike a lot of issues that be, that are currently polarized, that worker ownership and economic democracy would, uh, that there would be a, a rising consensus, you know, in the ways that President Ronald Reagan touted the virtues of employee ownership all the way back in the 80s. And a lot of people aren't familiar with that because many people associate cooperatives 
uh, as something that is uh, more democratic or progressive, uh, when really I think that there's a large appetite even in in uh, very quote unquote red states and, and counties um, for worker ownership. I think the difference here is that we would be uh, hitching some of that vision and some of the technical work that needs to happen, policy changes, et cetera, with the rising labor movement. So things like the union movements with Starbucks and Amazon, uh, working more closely with the Department of Labor and working with unions to, to incubate or develop uh, workforces into cooperatives themselves. And, uh, and then also having a much stronger partnership with some of those uh, government agencies like the Small Business Administration I'd mentioned earlier, working with the Department of Transportation to undertake infrastructure projects in partnership with solidarity economy institutions and really envisioning different ways that we can build our society. Okay. What would society look like? I think in some ways, economic democracy builds more buy-in and traction and belief and engagement in political democracy. Right. And so as we see obstruction with people feeling disenfranchised and disengaged and disempowered politically by starting to build an easier on ramp for participation and engagement through economic democracy, things that touch their day to day lives that they can see pretty immediately in their communities, it begins to have uh, to, to reweave the fabric of civil society. Right. So we then start to see more voter turnout, more participation in things like school boards, uh, PTAs, healthier communities, more uh, more of a demand and a belief in accountability, like more people applying their vision of what would it look like for healthcare companies um, to be accountable, for credit card companies to be accountable. Um, so some of the things that seem like marginalized as political demands and campaigns would be just more everyday topics of conversation um, and people showing up and, 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 and coming together to say, hey, here's how I think hospitals, universities, community colleges need, need to change in our lives. You've got it, bro. You make, you, you make a world I want to live in, and that's why we're having this program and this conversation. So we'd like for everybody out there to join a co-op. Or go start one. Go to federation.coop. Yes, Federation to work at co-ops and figure out how you can start a co-op or join a co-op. Thank you very much. We'll see you next Thursday. Live cooperative. Next month. And ours is usworker.coop. And you can find information at conference.coop for our event next month. Thanks, bro. Thanks. Thanks.